these are unusual times and many of us have experienced unusual weather. So what happened to the roof? Did it keep out the rain or did you have problems which impacted on business operations, your tenant or even your insurance policy? If you are in Melbourne listening to this webinar, you probably are asking what's the problem? But I'm sure that anyone who lives in Sydney or Brisbane certainly knows some of about the weather that we've just been having recently. So roofs are often forgotten because they are hard to maintain and potentially dangerous to maintain as well. So however, PropTech is solving some of these challenges. Hi, my name is Simon Hayes. I'm the Secretary of the PropTech Association of Australia. It's great to have you here for today's panel discussion on roof tech, highlighting some of the issues and solutions to an often forgotten part of the property asset. But before proceeding, I would like to make an acknowledgement of country today. I'm in Sydney, sorry, I apologize, I'm in Melbourne actually, but, but I normally would be in Sydney, which is on the traditional lands of the Gadigals people of the Aurora Nation. I pay respect to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge that because of this is a virtual event, we have our, we are meeting on different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders lands across, right across Australia. And so I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands you are on, wherever you are, and pay respect to their elders past, present and future. So before introducing our panellists, I'd like, I'd especially like to thank our main sponsors, Stone and Chalk, who have made this event possible, and our foundation partners, Macquarie Bank, Ashurst Lawyers, Real Estate Institute of Western Australia, Hexa and Webbit. Now to introduce our panellists. First, of our panels is Georgie Fenwick, who is the CEO and co-founder of Tell Frankie. Hi, Georgie. How are you today? Good. Thanks. Thanks for having. Thanks for having us today. It's going to be a really cool discussion. Right. And then the <laughs> next is Derek Freeby, who is the CEO and co-founder of Trendspec. Hi, Derek. everyone. <laughs> and then our third panelist is Richard Romanowski, uh, executive director and co-founder of Alexis Energy. Now, I hope I said that right. You did that really well. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Okay. So welcome everyone. And look, I should say too, if you, if, if anyone wants to jump in with comments, uh, feel free at any time um, to interrupt me or to, and, and certainly to contribute to the discussion at any time would be fantastic. But I'd like, look, I want to start with Georgie first and, and let's Georgie to tell us a little bit about Tell Frankie. And, and what value you're bringing to landlords and tenants and what, what, what Tell Frankie is about and maybe just a quick elevator pitch and to share an example of the, some of the work that Tell Frankie has been doing. Absolutely. And super excited to get this discussion going today on roofing. We've got some really fascinating, essentially customer examples to go through today and solving and solving the, the gap, what we all see as a major gap in the market. I think JFK once said, the best time to repair a roof is when the sun is shining. We could not agree more. As you mentioned, it can be both complex in terms of the scale of industrial, industrial roofs around in the commercial landscape. And also dangerous when you're working from heights and windy can so one of the one of the key things that that Frankie's really passionate about is working at a, at a commercial portfolio scale which means managing either dozens or hundreds of roofs at the same time you can think of a large big box retail network or a or a transport operator with a network of facilities across the country or across Australasia and just the complexity in terms of managing work with contractors to ensure that a roof is well maintained over time I think Derek and I have had amazing discussions just about the age and stage of different buildings and the need to consider roof as well as some of the other major systems within within the structure itself. But today we're going to go deep on, on what, what goes wrong and then how you can get ahead of them. So we've got a, a network of partners who we work with across New Zealand and are just starting to get into Australia as well. And it's all about, hey, what do we need to think about from a five-year perspective? perspective, a 10-year capital perspective, and then what do we need to do on a month-to-month -month basis as a property? So when you think of Frankie, it's operation software at a portfolio scale. And, and it's not just roofs though, is it? No, roofs are obviously one of the major sort of capex risks. We just had some huge rainfall in Auckland yesterday. A number of a number of roofs completely failed and either stock was damaged, sites were shut down, and just operational capacity for the day and probably this week is massively hit. But then equally you can have other critical assets from HVAC and refrigeration right through to drainage um, that you can manage on Frankie as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Derek, you're next because you, as I, as I look at my, my slide or my, 
my, my Zoom call. You're up next. And please tell us a little bit about Transpec, a bit of an elevator pitch, maybe some example of what you've been doing and working on recently. Yeah, no problem. So Trendspec is an effectively an evolution. We started our first company back in 2013 in drone services, but why we solved one challenge with technology of using tech to keep people off the roof. The biggest issue was we were creating another one where that data or thousands of photographs provided no context and, and formed or went into the same 2D, 2D PDF reports that everyone was accustomed to. And the problem with that was owners and managers are making decisions, which are often risky and critical decisions based on lack of information or evidence. So in 2018, Transpec was born to solve that challenge. And over those years, we've developed our, what we call our precision asset intelligence software or PAI software which effectively enables all stakeholders from owners, engineers, contractors to log in through any web browser anywhere in the world and do a digital assessment of an asset or the condition of a roof, which means they can inspect any part and have that evidence to make those critical decisions, whether it's based on risk protection or optimization and then create those 3D interactive reports for going forward. So primarily focused around commercial, industrial, warehousing and logistics is, is where we sit. What, what would be some of the biggest issues that you would see during that, that come out of the, the, you know, the surveys that, that, that are undertaken? The biggest one I know at the moment is most owners are looking to achieve some sort of ESG target. And the most common one at the moment is solar. So some are trying to install three to 400,000 panels across their portfolio. And not only can we do the visual condition assessment, which they normally send people up on the roof to do, they normally back that up with sending surveyors to determine roof deflection to see if there's any high risk areas or structural concerns, which we can now take that 12 week process down to a 48 hour zero touch process. So there's, that's probably one of the, the big movements we've seen at the moment, but layering that information, the biggest part going forward is just the usability of data to make better decisions, not only now, but your five, 10 year CapEx plans. That's what we're seeing now. Oh, good. Thank you. That is a brilliant segue into Richard and some of the work that he does. But Richard, why don't you tell us a little about Alexis? And, thank you, and, and thank you Simon. So we're a very advanced technology company, invented the technology in Australia, like Derek and the like, and we radically increased the amount of clean energy that we can put into the local suburbs. What that means for a roof, for a property owner, I can increase the value of your property by five to $10 million. I can increase the value of your property by five to $10 million by turning your, your building into a mini clean energy power plant at no capital cost or OPEX cost to you. So that's what we do. We actually move the solar farm and the wind farm into the city, turn your building into a clean energy, pardon me, add a clean energy power plant to your site. We actually pay your rent radically increases the value of your property, reduces the energy cost to your tenant, attracts better quality tenants, all done through third-party financing so you don't have to put this on your balance sheets. And in most of the cases, even the tenant will get to net zero from this process. And then you go, you're going to say, but other people are doing this. I'm going, yeah, but we do it 10 times bigger. So our technology, so that means instead of 5 million, someone else might increase the value of property by 500,000. I increased the property by $5 million. That, so our technology allows much more energy to go backwards into the grid. That means I can make this property power plant 10 times bigger and pay you 10 times more rent, 10 times more value, increased value in your property just by using your roof. So I'm using your roof, but I need to talk to Georgie and Derek to make sure that it, it doesn't flood. Well, there's lots of risks, but that's all part of the whole process. But effectively, yeah, we need to, this, we, we need to decarbonize and we can, I'll just finish off by saying, so Simon, one last thing is 
There's lots of studies all over the world that if we filled our rooftops, mainly our commercial and industrial rooftops with, with solar, and then we need to have batteries, we can actually generate most of the energy we need right in our cities. So it's just a paradigm shift. We're all rushing to build solar farms and wind farms. We still need solar farms and wind farms. We're never going to build enough of them. We can't, we just cannot build enough of them. We need to focus on the problem can be solved right there with you, your building, and we can fix it. Good, thank you. I suppose one thing or I do want to ask, and I'm going to come back to and the panel and ask a few different questions but one i did have for you richard was is that you spoke about the owner of the property have you done much in, in terms of work for a tenant might be sitting underneath a, a large industrial warehouse or something like that and they need they have their operations there or they might have refrigeration or anything other bits and pieces like that which they need to do and tenants have got you in as well have, have they got you in as well to do that absolutely so we work yeah. with both we have to work with both to pull this off right so that so you need the the landlord to agree to let us rent the space and the tenant has to agree to, to that. And we, so we are working with that, but we're, we're at early stage commercialization. So we're just beginning to, to get traction. So like anyone who's interested, talk to us, <laughs> but we really were, it's here in Australia, we're, we're getting traction. We're in the UK, we're in Singapore, we're in New York. So we're expanding globally, but the main focus is Australia. Get, get all our activities and traction in Australia first and then go global because it, this is a global property, yeah. global, global, global issue. So did that, does that answer your question? Is that enough? Yeah, no, that's, that's very good. Like it's, you, you, what you're saying is certainly not limited to anything. You can go global and you can apply to almost all assets is what you're saying. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll come back to another question I got, but I do want to go back to Georgie because I'm very interested in starting off with the very basic. If we're talking about roofs in particular, what mostly goes wrong with the roof? I mean, sure yeah. it leaks, but, but like sure it leaks, but then what's caused of that or what are you seeing or is it the type of roofs or is it the... Well, to Richard's, Richard's point, I could not agree. And I think we all agree that the potential for solar and wind in cities is absolutely massive. And if we create the foundations of a good roofing network that can handle the load associated with, with the with the solar panels and with the roofing with any sort of wind generation infrastructure as well, it just creates this whole world of possibility to actually upskill. And so in terms of what can go wrong and how to create that foundation, Derek will be able to add a whole bunch of color to this. But if I just share screen in terms of some of the things that we tend to see, can you see that there okay? Yeah. yeah, so okay. thank you. Perfect. So we've had a whole bunch of rain and that creates a whole bunch of issues. What can go wrong? This is a, a national supermarket chain yesterday in Auckland. And so in terms of drainage and, and roofing issues in the roof, what's probably likely caused that is block gutters. And this is where it becomes just really basic, but block gutters, not looking at sort of internal gutter systems in particular, too much load. So putting the load in potentially and then rust and corrosion over time. And this is where, when you think of healthcare, you think of some of the chronic issues, but you also think about accidents. And the chronic issues within roofing is that buildings are definitely designed for them. You can put a solar array really nicely on top of commercial industrial, but keeping them maintained in the long run and having Derek provide the condition assessment over a number of every six months or every year, depending on the age and stage of the, the building and having Richard install the solar panels and then maintaining those assets over time. That's the really exciting opportunity we see. In and and with, how often do you think that obviously when you, people are surveying and people under, and you're understanding what the issues are that are coming up, how often do you need to get someone up on the roof to actually fix things? Is it like a general rule of thumbs or is it just it depend, depends on the climate we say an annual survey just before just before winter um sets in Derek do you have a thought on that though because it'd be really interesting to get your thoughts on that because it's a real life cycle question as well yeah what we found is most especially in the industrial space do it biannually but what we've found through the accessibility of, of technology the the cost reduction so great it affords them enables them to do it more often yep. which is important now because unusual weather or unusual is our new usual yep. um, so by layering better information on top of each other you can start picking up 
like for instance that corrosion on the screen you can start picking that up earlier yeah um, before it spreads too much and especially with anything like loose sheeting with fine we still find so much asbestos believe it or not across roofs that yeah. is breaking apart so being able to pick up these things earlier i see more doing it either on an annual basis now plus ad hoc post weather event yeah we had a situation with a customer um, last month where the pearl, if we assessed the and worked with those partners to assess the building about five years earlier, then we could have essentially saved the structural components of the building. But because the basically the water ingress had become so bad through the sheet through the sheet metal on top on the top of the building, it had essentially rusted through into the purlins. And so the whole building became in need of replacement essentially. So instead of just it's like that saying for want of a nail the horse was lost and then it flows on to the battle the war and the battle was lost. It's exactly the same with roofing. If you can get in earlier and put a whole program around both the maintenance and your cost outlays, it can save millions, if not tens of millions, of rebuild costs. Yeah. May I jump in? Oh, oh totally. Yeah. We, we, I remember we're still young and early stage and the first, you know, the larger property owners, you know, when we, we talked to them maybe a couple of years ago, they went, it's just not worth the, the risk, the, the worried about the roof, the solar on the roof, worried about, you know, we're talking about, we need a 20 year, 15 or 20 year life for the solar panels. Yep. So it's, I can see um, just by looking at this and then talking to Derek, listening to Derek, it's such a big issue for the property um, managers. Their roofing is such a problem. And then they go, don't touch. My, I think that the main store, the main angle I got is don't touch my roof. It's hard. It's, it's a pain. In the, it's a, it's a yep. pain, in the, pain in the bum. So, so you don't have to edit that one out. <laughs> yeah. No. But, and, and, but, and so here I am. I'm trying to put solar on the roof to get it, you know, and, and do that over with the 20 year life. So yeah. we, we get insurance to handle solar related issues on the roof, but it, I'm sure there's so much more that can go wrong. So I'm just, that's just my two cents. So I need yeah. help. I think but that's where I think putting in place the risk mitigation strategy, which is a great survey from Derek and then planning out a whole bunch of maintenance from a Frankie perspective can be absolutely outstanding because it comes down to general rules of thumb and just getting a, getting ahead of some of those risks, but not preventing some of those really important decisions, which is, Hey, we need, we need more capacity in our electricity grid and we need more clean energy. Roofing is a fantastic opportunity for that. How do we create tools so that people can work smarter, not harder, essentially. And just, to, uh, you've pulled up a screen here, a slide, sorry. Yeah, please go through that one. I'm quite interested in this one. So just to... Yeah. So I think we're property managers, we've grown about a billion dollars worth of property here in New Zealand at the moment. And property managers are just extremely busy people. Not only are you working from a roofing perspective, you're also looking at cleaning events, you're looking at kitchens and bathrooms and all sorts of things. And so I think one of the reasons why roofing is, is often forgotten, but one of the biggest risks in a property is just time. But we can, where we can simplify work plans and work with trusted contractors to really put together the right budgets and capex plans and opex and opex spends on an annual basis, then you get to this amazing world where, sure, it might be a um, twenty-five-year-old roof, but you're willing to in, in it on the short term to extend it to thirty and then look at replacing it and look at what building products you might use on the other side to, to replace it after that. But yeah, it just comes down to, to using, understanding and setting aside time. Time is the, is obviously the most important word there and working together with your owners and contractors and managers to make the smart decisions associated with something like roofing. All right, just a quick question, Derek, is this something that you do see a lot of, you've seen rust you've seen we've seen gutters other things that you see are significant when you're doing those surveys as well that that people should be looking out for and perhaps you could even talk about the the, the facade or the sides of the of, of buildings as well and perhaps that will actually show give a bit more insight as well because you mean yes that it's not technically the roof but it's the size but it's still protecting you from the the elements yeah the the biggest thing we do see primarily is corrosion and lifting roof sheeting would be the two big the biggest things we see especially now that we've moved into roof deflection a reporting which we can pull out of the same model actually i can show you i should be able to show you so a lot of debris 
we used to be surprised with how much was left on a roof post maintenance work. They'll just leave their off cuts there and Gosh. pack up and walk away. There's always debris. We find a lot of tenant caused damage. So if you zoom in, a lot of them that will do cutouts in the roof to install their own equipment and then do a dodge patch and then check out. I said, that's one of the other, the big keys. But besides that, like for industrial complex, non-roof is a lot of ha hard stand conditions. So like a lot of the hard stands with like significant cracking, which costs a fortune then to rip up and replace. But if I, if that switches over, that's what we pull out of a roof deflection report. And what we're finding at the moment and partly COVID led, I think, there's just a huge demand for cold storage, which means tenants was finding a lot of tenants subletting cold storage areas. And for instance, in this roof deflection map, this dark heat map area is where it's more than a hundred mil below the plane. So it's partially collapsing. And this was found because they wanted to install a solar array along this. And upon inspection, it was determined that the tenant actually were hanging cooling units from support rafters, bringing down the roof with it, which in all intents purposes is an insurance claim could be up to 30 plus million dollars when you count for debris removal, housing, the tenant rebuilding that structure. So what we're finding a lot of tenants are using this type of information for their own internal governance. So they got better compliance records, better insurance records, better records in the event of a tenancy dispute. So a lot of root structural roof defects and then facades, the same applies because we're really modeling any built structure. For instance, we just did one in Brisbane CBD to find 146 meters above the ground, hundred kilo concrete facade panels with loose brackets. So it's the last thing you want to do is have one of yeah. those fall, fall on no your head straight downtown down, yeah. clean straight as you get yeah. in your latte. But yeah, the, the big one that we've found is, is around a lot of ESG factors. And interestingly enough, a lot of modeling around. So when a lot of owners did an ESG initiative and it was like to have more green space, planting trees, those trees have now grown up. And now they're causing their own problems because they've got limbs hanging over the roof. And now the costs of having an arborist go around and check those adds its own ESG component. Cause now you've got people driving to and from site all the time. One of the big challenges we're trying to solve is reducing all of those site visits where somebody can just log in and, and visit the site digitally instead of having to do that. And uh, I've got a question here actually from our panelists from Jam. Uh, who's, who's online and it's a good question uh, and I know that we've spoken more about commercial property but can we say use these learnings and the yeah the systems and technology that we have and move them to more towards a residential premises and you know aggregation of private accounts getting together and sort of looking at their roofs is that sort of some I mean doesn't sound like it's been done before but is it a possibility yeah most definitely I think that's the opportunity that you see in commercial technology starting to democratize over time. And, and absolutely, I loved your, um, I just read the, the comment before Jan and, and, and looking at it from just as you've seen through Derek's technology and with satellite information to understand the condition so that the roofers can know about the status of the status of the state of the roof before they go on site and, and actually understand, Hey, this is the condition and these are the likely problems. You can see some amazing opportunities in that space. Most definitely. Would you agree, Derek? Mm. Yeah. And what about, okay. And so Richard, you've been quiet for a while, which I know that that must be very hard for you. I, I don't want to leave you there. I don't want to leave you there sitting. I know you're bursting. I know you're bursting with information. One thing is, sorry, you, please add a comment. One thing I do want to ask you was, is I know solar is an obvious one to put on roofs. There has been mentioned, what else can you do, which will go into the Alexis system, which will be to create clean the green energy from any energy going backwards into the grid is yep. what we fix. So we radically increase the amount of 
energy that can go backwards. If you think of the coal power station as this huge, massive tsunami coming at you into the city, which is then we use, now we're trying to turn that around. We're trying to create the, the, the energy tsunami in our suburbs. And the grid was never designed for it. And we fix that. That's how we're able to then create a 10 times bigger microgrid. I'll just share my screen. Oh, it's please my, do. my turn to do this. Yeah, my turn. <laughs> I don't have anything. <laughs> <by> <laughs> it. I hope, I hope I'm not sure if I'm doing this. So uh, yeah, it looks good. I can see that. Is the IKEA? Yeah. I'm just going to go full, yep. full screen. As, can you see the full screen or you see my, I see your notes on your next slides. So I see. Uh, the last, if you go back, the last one with source screen, that's perfect. All right. So, yes. so this is what IKEA looks like. So this is our IKEA flagship and we're filling it with a rooftop and they're also putting a solar car park in. So it's two megawatts of energy, which is big. It's not the biggest in Australia, but it's big. And the main, and then underneath there is, here is the Alexis batteries and Alexis system. And that lets us send energy backwards into the grid. So 60% of this energy is going backwards into the grid and 40% is being used on site by IKEA. What the conversation with Georgie and Derek helped highlight to me is why we haven't spent time with many property, property managers yet, but, but a lot of, a few of them have said to me, don't touch my roof. It's, I can see. So, you know, in this case, we've done a huge inspection of the roof was done to make sure that it, it had the structural and then it was up to speed because it's a, this is a 20 year installation that solar is on that roof for 20 years. And then, and so that's what I'm hearing from Georgie and Derek, you still, they're still going to have to ma maintain, there's still going to be things they have to do. So it's a huge area. So, so I'm trying to decarbonize the world by filling the rooftops. I'm just being blunt guys. I'm trying, and that's my job. I'm, and the, why we invented this technology is we need to, you know, save the planet. So one, one of the easiest way to save the planet is to fill the rooftops with solar. But one of the barriers of course, is the roof, the quality of the rooftops, the structural, the age, uh, will it last 20 years? All, all I can do is say, we, we, each of our sites, we do all that up front as best as we can. There's insurance to make sure that, that, you know, pr problems are looked after as best as possible. I'm sure there's always a a loophole in every insurance policy, but this is, this is Ikea. It's 10 times bigger. So traditionally using, not using Alexis technology, this would have been like a 500 kilowatt system. So about, uh, five, $600,000 in CapEx and, and people will do that, install that on your, as a microgrid free of charge, our technology, this becomes a five megawatt system with the, the two megawatts of rooftop and three megawatts of batteries. It's a five megawatt power station. Uh, so it radically increases the value of your property, more rent. Ikea will get net zero from this location, which is huge because they get a huge, a huge reduction in their energy bill. Instead of having to buy, to get to net zero, they would traditionally buy energy from a solar farm or wind farm, which actually costs them more. It doesn't save them money. So I'll stop there and see if there's. I, I did have one um, question for you and it's probably picking up on what Jan, the question Jan had asked is, can you apply what you've done there? Say on Ikea and just think of Ikea has got what? 10,000 square meters of roof space or 20,000 square meters of roof space. Think of 20,000 square meters of roof space across uh, a suburb or something like that. Can, can Alexis then be applied to that if everyone puts, you know? Yeah. So we're, we're designed exactly what we're designed to do, Simon. Thank you for that question. So we're designed. So just think of it as a, if you have an industrial suburb, we can put solar on every single rooftop. If you, if you have a mix of residential and industrial, our residential solution is slightly different. It's not it's one Alexis unit for 100 houses. So we don't have to put right. one on every building. So we can do a residential solution, but our main focus, our, our path to market at the moment is commercial yeah. and industrial. That's, it's the residential is, I'll stop there. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was, I was starting to enjoy that. What are you talking about? <laughs> you, you were just taking me down a rabbit hole. No, I was, I was trying to, I was, look, I've always had this passion where you, where I see small blocks of land around my suburbs, my suburb that I walk around. I said, surely there could be like a, a small battery pack here where and everyone just drawing, you know, drawing energy. That's part of what we're doing. So yeah. Uh, yeah. another product that we have is a battery pack with uh, EV fast charging. So we're right. offering that to the community, to commercial sites in Australia. We can install that. Yeah. 
we can install two EV fast chargers free of charge anywhere in Australia, almost anywhere in Australia. And we're focusing on industrial sites. So if you have a Georgie, if you have a client who has a problem with the roof, we can still help them <laughs> with, with EV fast charging. So again, that's, it's, that's and, the, and then we're doing that Simon in suburbs. So we can go into, okay. a, into a suburb like your, the concept of the future is when you have, everyone has an EV, mm. you'll have a slow charger in the house, mm. but if you want to do a fast charge, where do I go? So there'll be, we, we're looking to put one in just, you know, at the end of your block, basically. Okay. And my last question is, well, which being a, 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 a dummy around PV is what happens when the sun doesn't shine? Because everyone always asks that question. Every property person always asks that question. So how efficient, effective when the sun doesn't shine, say the IKEA example that you gave. Yeah. So on sunny days, it's the, the solar still works in clouds. You're still going to, if you're outside and you've got your ba bikini on, you're still going to get sunburned even if it's raining. So, so but yeah. it's just going to take longer. So we know the sun always still works. So yes, it works less in, in cloud. And of course there's a you know horrible storm. It's, it works less, but it still works. Okay. And that's all built into our model. And then obviously on sunny days and, you know, and, and summer days, it's working much more effectively. So that's all averaged out over the year and you end up with effectively a power plant. And you have to adjust then for, uh, different, um, areas of just say Australia, obviously Melbourne or Tasmania is different to if yes. you're putting something in cans. So the amount of energy I get from a solar rooftop in Brisbane is more than Melbourne, but that's all built into the business model, but that's my problem, not the property owner's problem. You know, we take all that away from you. So we'll, we, that's the whole concept of a no capex, no opex, super microgrid. Yes. You can ask me all those questions and we'll explain it all. But, but it's not your, it's not the property owners or the tenants worry. So they just get rent. They, uh, the, the property tenant gets rent. They get, um, the land, the tenant gets uh, cheap energy, carbon credits, stuff like that. Okay, I'm going to change tack. I'm going to go to Derek. Tend to be picked up. I actually was interested. It's, it's getting a bit more cerebral. Well, for me anyway, maybe not for everyone else, but the, you collect a lot of, like Transpec collects a lot of data and I'm sure there's, do you, are there opportunities or, or are you already doing it or are you having your data being integrated into say the um, digital twins and are you getting, yeah, or are you getting your data integrated into other data sources and, and how is, is that being, is that occurring at the moment or you know, there's an opportunity for it? There's a few pieces. I guess Transpec is a form of digital twin, but what that buzzword has become now is more associated with design modeling. IOT sensors, the perception within the industry is that it's something that will deliver a turn in the future. So we'll collect this information and then in five years time, we'll benefit from it. Where what we're delivering is what we call a precision reality twin. So it's built off real life information and provides instant return. That type of information can then be supplemented as we've shown like roof deflection heat maps, we can add the same type of modeling, but using thermal cameras um, to start identifying heat loss or cooling loss for better sustainability and energy consumption. But what we tend to do is we become the center for that information. So an owner can log in, quickly look down a list of more, they more look at the data side of it, not the model side of it. So they'll just show me what's a structural defect that's high risk that needs immediate attention. Then if that's concerning to them, then they can look in and get the context of where it is. But we see that integration of what we do in the ecosystem. So for instance, when we do deliver the first reality twin, a proper property surveyor will tend to log in, complete a full desktop condition assessment then the owner or manager will log in, do that analysis, as I just said, but then they'll integrate and share that with, for instance, engineering who might do a further analysis or want to then target and do a physical inspection of particular areas, or it could go straight to a maintenance piece where that's then shared direct with multiple contractors to then plan scope. Cause you can then take all the measurements access the site because what we found like some 
sometimes it costs five to ten thousand dollars just to get the quote when people have to go up and, and do that analysis so integrating the data through an ecosystem and then that can then be extended like we see it then sharing it with insurance brokers who then can share it with underwriters to get better underwriting terms so when we talk about data integration we normally talk about it through people integration and connecting all of those people to one source so they're all working off the same um, information but then the data in the literal sense can be exported into other ERP systems work order packages things like that along with all of that embedded information. So if they wanted to click in an ERP system or something to, it will then open and fly them to that exact point to be able to view it digitally. So they're the kind of ways we look at integration. Okay, very good. I mean, is there, I'm going to ask, open this for everyone, but, and Jan's asked, asked another question, which is, around uh, do actually any Australian standards exist for roof mates? Does, any, does anyone know that? I, I don't know that myself. So maybe George or Derek or Richard. Derek can keep me very honest here. I don't think that there are some pretty clear building standards and that is very specific to the location. And that's what we mean. Like buildings, particularly commercial and industrial, tends to be built really well. You've got a lot of rainfall to collect off a 10,000 square meter roof that then needs to go into drainage and attenuation. And so that tends to be pretty well calculated. I think there is a whole opportunity for thinking about this in a whole a much more systematic way. But Derek. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's mainly in the construction phase, the actual yeah. ongoing maintenance and condition is usually yeah. each organization has their own assessment matrix and procedures. But interestingly, like places like Singapore have actually gone to government mandated. So they're building facades if it's over and it's not even high, I think it's like, it's over 14 meters. They have to, and over X amount of years, it has to do a manual. You have to do a hundred percent visual inspection and a 10% physical inspection yep. and actually provide that evidence and compliance checks to the government because they're worried about things falling off injury, everything like that. Yeah. It, it will, I don't know if Australia will see that, but Definitely be industry led and primarily around the ever increasing demand. And I don't think we'll see demand slow down for industrial property. We're all gotten used to buying everything online. The demand for more storage or more tin sheds is growing and it won't. Yeah. And then throw in the unpredictability of weather, especially like well, we've seen it. We've gone from raging fires to now floods to savage storms. I think in Sydney alone, this past summer, we've seen three shopping centers have roof collapses. And then for the owner of those shopping centers, like those people going to those, they're straight on social media going, oh, went to this shopping center, roof collapse, almost killed me, the, the full drummer. But that's life now. So I think it'll be industry led to be more proactive in maintaining these. I do have another question from Jan. So thank you, Jan, for being very, asking a few, a few great questions. And it's probably maybe let's, Georgie, I'll try to answer, start with this one for you. It's just how is roof maintenance under all those PVs? How can painting and repairs? And then the next bit of it, and we go to Derek is, can you see any damage under the PVs? And maybe Richard's got a good comment on that as well. So please, um, Georgie, Derek, Richard, go ahead. Yeah, I think Richard will be able to provide some amazing insights here. I think where we see fastener systems really come into their own with PVs, where PVs are present, present on roofs, that's completely it. It's a slight difference between bolting down PVs on or photovoltaic cell arrays, otherwise known as solar arrays, on, on roofs. It can be done with clips or it can be done with bolts. And so that opens up a whole bunch of cleaning opportunity there. Equally, we have a system here in New Zealand called Monkey Toe, which is a, essentially a walkway, which enables easier cleaning around and on roofs, no matter what, and just provides a safe space for that to take. So yeah, it's a real mix, but one of the challenges we'd be keen to work on and help standardize in the industry. Yeah, our perspective, if we can't see it, 
No, if it's under the panel, we wouldn't be able to see that. Mainly what we've done around big solar arrays is the thermal imaging because they're just checking cells pretty much. But a lot of the new roofs we've seen these new pre-coated sheeting. So it's got that, it's like an epoxy reflective resin, which makes it mirror-like for, for the heat loss. So I believe that a lot of the clients we've worked with, I know that a lot of them are using that in new builds, which negates a lot of the painting requirements. So my, my answer, Simon, is we're, we actually care about that roof as much as you because we're, it's generating income for us. So now all of a sudden we were up there. So obviously when we install, we work with the property owner to make sure that it's got the, everything is fixed up, cleaned up, whatever, all these issues that Georgie and Derek highlighted are not there so that it's got potential for a 20 year. And then we're on the roof. We, excuse me, Derek, we're doing physical inspections. It's part of our, it's part of our DNA because it's in our interest to make sure that things are working properly from the solar perspective. And, and obviously we'll also look at the roof. We need to probably enhance our, just from this conversation, I probably need to enhance our inspection side, learn from Georgie and Derek and talk to you guys offline. But effectively we're up there way more than the property owner would be on their own. Cause remember we, this is now we've got a, we're on, on the same page as you. We, we own that roof. We don't own that roof. We own three or $4 million worth or $5 million worth of assets on that roof. And we're going to, we're going to look after it. I think that's the prime thing across all stakeholders, everyone from your perspective, yeah. from an owner's perspective, the shed is not just a shed, it's high value revenue generating asset. So they don't want solar to fail. They don't want a roof collapse. And the insurers roof. don't want to see that. The roof is not a problem anymore. We fixed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just, thank you, Derek. You said that really well, right? It's, it's all of a sudden when I'm understanding the property industry just go, oh shit, my, excuse me, the French, the roof, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, 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 and changing with the, with yourselves, with George, Derek, we're changing that. And with solar, we're changing that into, this is now um, an energy, I mean, an income earning asset. Thank you. I'll shut up your turn. <laughs> so, and that's, that's probably a good thing. We've got five, just under, just over five minutes to go um, before we get cut off. Last closing comments, anyone, everyone. Georgie first, because do you want to go first? Closing comment, and then we'll go Derek and Richard again. Closing comments. Absolutely. I'll just mirror what Richard just said, control the chaos so that we can raise the roof. Haha, <laughs> puns in terms of in terms of property in the city. I think there are some really exciting things to be done if we create the right foundations. I would say always think about collecting usable data. And the big thing to note, and we've seen this a lot, is if you don't start now, everybody else has, and you can't go back in time to collect it. So the more data you have, the more understanding you'll have, the better you will be predicting the future. My approach would be, we need to save the planet. We need to de decarbonize. Your roof is a fundamental part of that future. And Georgie and Derek have shown that the maintenance side can be overcome. So we can... There's many ways to make sure that the, that horrible roof that's always a pain in pain for you is now something that we can fix it, uh, not just us, but other specialists like Derek and, and Georgie. So please think about the planet. Think about decarbonizing. Your tenant wants to get to net zero. You want to get there. Let's do this, guys. So that's my finish, Simon. And I think I add on that is um, I think it's a society thing where what we're trying to do is extend the life of buildings yeah. and all infrastructure instead of just demolishing it, rebuilding it. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Well, now we're given the time, it's four minutes to go, but, um, so thank you. Thank you, Georgie, <coughs> Sue, Derek and Richard for joining. But thank you everyone who've tuned in to listen to this. It's funny how it's 1256 now in, in Melbourne and people are thinking, how could you possibly talk about roofs for an hour? But we've done it very easy and very quickly. It's gone very quickly. So thank you for um, the panelists and thank you, Jan, also for your great question. And lastly, I want to thank PropTech Association 
Committee. And this webinar is one in a series that focuses on commercial property sectors. So look out in the future for future events that are coming to your inbox or follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook. And I also wanted to say a very big thank you to Stone and Chalk for getting behind this event and their support to the Australian property industry. I will leave it there and uh, hopefully we've got some food for thought on uh, roofing and making sure that it's properly maintained and also everyone thinking about how you can make money off it. So thank you for your time, everyone, and thank you for the panelists. Thank you. I think we're done. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Everyone. Oh.